dear chair of the Park Council of England and Wales, dear colleagues and distinguished guests, it is a great honor and at the same time a huge responsibility to share my experience and to represent my thoughts standing at this place at Middle Temple, where every millimeter is a history in a remarkable year of celebration, 40, um, 450 years of a whole. As you know, my lecture aims to spotlight the delicate task of balancing judicial reform with independence, affirming the judiciary's role as stabilizing force even in the face of external aggression. I find it sensible to start with introductory remarks concerning Ukraine's legal and judiciary systems. And after that, we will move to challenges of the, to the rule of law and um, possible steps to address them in the given con uh, context. I will start by saying that belonging to continental Romano Germanic legal system means conceptually that the Ukrainian legal system proceeds from abstractions formulates general principles and definitions and uh, distinguishes substantive law from procedural law. It holds court's case law secondary and considers the legislation as a dominant source of law, with the only exception prescribed by the law on execution of judgments and implementation of practice of the European Court of Human Rights which stipulates that the national courts apply the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights directly as a source of law in their proceedings. It means that in every individual case, the Ukrainian court will interpret the national legislation again and again within the context of the given circumstances and facts of the particular case, considering the provisions of the Convention and relevant practice of the European Court of Human Rights. The national courts of Ukraine may also apply sources of international law if it is needed. They may refer to the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union, but only as the interpretation acts of the European Union law and not direct sources of law. On one hand, the application of multiple sources of law in every case gives more room for involving the national court's interpretation practice. Ronald Dworkin asked us to consider a situation in which judges and lawyers were grappling with hard issues of interpretation or with difficult dilemmas posed by multiple sources of law. He said that in such cases we might say that what was required as a matter of law might be different from what was required as a matter of justice. That's why, on the other hand, the possibility of interpreting the same laws in similar cases every time the Ukrainian court applies them complicates the coherence of the court's case law and law enforcement practice. To address this issue, as well as many others, such as the low level of public confidence in the judiciary and serious structural deficiencies identified by the European Court of Human Rights, the comprehensive judicial reform was started in Ukraine after the Revolution of Dignity 2014. It was a request of society to reform the judiciary and to bring to disciplinary responsibility those judges who detained participants of the revolution without sufficient uh, legal basis, thus casting doubt on their independence. The reform led to the transformation of the four-level general court system 
which was first and second instances, high courts with specialized jurisdiction and Supreme Court of Ukraine, to a three-level system, first and second instances and the Supreme Court. The reform was supposed to bring a new philosophy of the Supreme Court and the judiciary as such, fundamentally new human-centric approaches, the best court managing practices, and a new structure of judgments and quality of motivation. As a result of reform, the former Supreme Court of Ukraine was restructured and renamed the Supreme Court without a word Ukraine. Uh, through the amendments to the Constitution, which came into effect in September 2016, these draft amendments to the Constitution were discussed with the European Commission for Democracy through Law, Venice Commission. The new Judiciary Act 2016 provided for transitional provisions, including the establishment of the new Supreme Court and the appointment of judges based on competition results. The judges of the former Supreme Court of Ukraine had the right to participate in the competition for the new Supreme Court appointments. In November 2016, the High Qualification Commission of Judges announced a competition for 120 posts of judge for the Supreme Court. A total of 846 candidates participated in the competition. Among the candidates were 17 judges of the Supreme Court of Ukraine and six of them became the judges of the new Supreme Court. However, the plenary of the former Supreme Court of Ukraine challenged the provisions of the new Judiciary Act before the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, which ruled in their favor. And later, eight judges of the former Supreme Court of Ukraine made an application to the European Court of Human Rights. The judgment in this case was delivered in July 2021. In the case Guminuk and others against Ukraine, the European Court of Human Rights held that there had been a violation of Article 6, Paragraph 1 and Article 8 of the Convention. The court found that a clear lack of coordination in addressing the applicant's situation for a considerable period seriously undermined the legal certainty and predictability of the constitutional principles on judicial independence. Returning to the selection process, it was the first time in the history of Ukraine that the selection of judges to the Supreme Court was held in the form of open competition, grounded on the best practices of different 45 states, including US and the UK. It was the first time open for advocates and academicians, as well as career judges. The selection process took one year and included several stages, such as national legislation, knowledge examination, drafting a judgment, several psychological tests, and the interview with psychologists. Interviews with the member of high judicial, um, high quality commission of judges and the high council of judges as the two K judicial governance bodies. In the final ceremonial stage, the president of Ukraine issued a decree on the appointment of judges of the proposal of the High Council of Judge Justice. The new Supreme Court began operating on the 15th of December 2017. It retained the power of cassation review and it was composed, composed on of the Grand Chamber and four cassation courts, uh, administrative, commercial, criminal, and civil cassation court. It consists of 152 judges to date, including 21 judges of the Grand Chamber. And the number of judges of the Supreme Court reducing naturally because of the retirement of judges. The judicial reform 2016 introduced a large number of innovations 
the new tools to ensure the unity and coherence of the court's practice, the new procedure for reference to the constitutional court, model case procedure, etc. Despite all previous work, unfortunately, the Supreme Court became known because of a high profile corruption case that was reported in the middle of May this year. The plenum of the Supreme Court reacted immediately and within two days its president was given a vote of no confidence and dismissed from his position. He was detained and an invest uh, investigating judge rejected several times to release him on bail. The National Anti-Corruption Bureau and the Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office completed the in investigation in this case recently on the 4th of October. It means that the materials of the case must be transferred to the High Anti-Corruption Court of Ukraine and open to the defense perusal. The version of suspicion is that the bribery was connected with decisions in favor of businessman Const Konstantin Zhivaga in the case of the Poltava mining and processing plant. Businessman Zhivaga rejected all the accusations of trying to bribe the Supreme Court. It is noticeable that recently a French court rejected an appeal from Ukraine's government to extradite Konstantin Zhivaga due to procedural concerns. It was stipulated in the numerous mass media. The court concluded that Ukraine is unable to guarantee that Mr. Zhivaga will be tried by a court that can ensure fundamental procedural guarantees and protection of the defense rights. I haven't seen the text of the judgment yet, so I can't comment on it before reading the motivation from the beginning till the end. But my main concern is that just ipsa facta, all the previous work of the Supreme Court turned, into, turned out in a shadow on the background of the corruption case. It is very disappointing to observe how easily we can lose something we've been building with huge efforts. The general public has less trust and interest in the legal positions as such of the court. General public isn't interested in the fact that from the first days of war till the present, all judges of the Supreme Court have been donating 60, 60 percent of their salaries to the Ukrainian army. Moreover, according to Ukrainian legislation, courts, courts must administer justice even during times of emergency or war times. During the war, the court system in general didn't stop functioning even for one single day. In 2022, the courts of Ukraine considered, considered around 3 million cases. The Supreme Court, including four Cassation courts, as I said, and the Grand Chamber, considered 71,000 cases for one year. Sadly, after the corruption case was reported, the political intentions, which initially appeared in 2019, to reform the Supreme Court as an institution again, uh, immediately became justified for civil society. In June 2023, the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine decided to enhance the fight against corruption in the judiciary. In response to that decision, the Parliamentary Committee on Legal Policy prepared the draft law as regards the introduction of additional procedures to enhance public trust in the judiciary. This draft law broadened the grounds for checking the integrity and discipline of judges by introducing a new type of court monitoring by the High Council of Justice and introduced the use of lie detector polygraph in various contexts of judicial career. 
On the 9th of October this year, the Venice Commission examined the draft law on request on High Council of Justice and concluded that it is not the first time that the Ukrainian authorities have prepared legislation to enhance public trust in the judiciary. In its uh, 2020 opinion, the Venice Commission observed that the judicial system of Ukraine has been subject to numerous changes in recent years. Following presidential elections, the new political power would often start new changes to the judicial system. In the absence of a holistic approach, various pieces of legislation were adopted that didn't have the character of a comprehensive reform. In this regard, the opinion also underlined the importance of the stability of the judicial system and the necessity to refrain from frequent fragmentary um, judicial reforms and ensure a comprehensive and coherent approach. The Venice Commission has earlier expressed its serious concerns regarding the use of lie detectors in the context of judicial career. This technology remains a largely controversial matter and should be avoided in the context of judicial career. This is even more so where such an initiative, uh, such an uh, intrusive tool may be used on broad grounds in an arbitrary manner and when it is not accompanied by effective remedies and procedural safeguards. In addition, the Venice Commission recalled that under its rule of law checklist, a law has to be inter alia, clear and predictable. I should mention that after this opinion, just last week, the above mentioned draft law was improved and the idea of applying a lie detector was removed from the draft text. But this example, just one of numerous ones, initiatives concerning the Supreme Court, which demonstrates rather a populistic approach than connected with the real needs of this institution. So how to ensure the independent high quality judiciary as a guarantor of the rule of law, especially in war times? The war that has been ravaging Ukraine since early 2014, and especially the full-scale invasion in February last year, brought new challenges and questions such as, will Russia's war kill the rule of law in Ukraine and Europe? I would rephrase the question, is it practically possible to ensure the rule of law during the full-scale law war? According to well-known philosopher Frederick Hayek, governance during wartime necessarily required total mobilization and management of all of society's manpower and resources. In this connection, my question is, where are the limits of such mobilization? May it affect the constitutional rights and freedom of, freedoms of a person, which are guaranteed in a peaceful time? And what is the judiciary's role as a stabilizing, uh, stabilizing force? To respond to these questions, first of all, I would like to say that in times of war, uh, laws of peace change to laws of war eventually. During the international armed conflict, the principles and norms of international humanitarian law must be respected, and national martial law may provide certain exceptions, limitations or restrictions from general rules. According to the Constitution of Ukraine, under the conditions of martial law or state of emergency, specific restrictions on rights and freedoms may be established with the indication of the period of effect for such restrictions. Secondly, during times of war, an interaction between the international law of human rights and international humanitarian law is coming on the stage. 
In the context of the protection of individual rights and freedoms, Ukraine is currently under the regulation of Article 15 of the Convention, which stipulates that in time of war or other public emergency threatening the life of the nation, any high contracting party may take measures derogating from its obligations under this convention to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation provided that such measures are not inconsistent with the other obligations under international law. And at the same time, non-derogable rights under the convention, convention are well known. There are rights to life, the prohibition of torture, prohibition of slavery, and no punishment without law. Thirdly, the judiciary's role manifests itself in the fact that there must not be any act or decision of state authority that is out of judicial control or beyond the rule of law. This role equally concerns international, supranational and national courts in the frames of their jurisdiction. And I should say that a special value of constitutional judicial control appears in connection with balancing the public interest, which changes in times of war to defense, national security, protection of the rights of freedom and freedoms of others, and individual constitutional rights and freedoms. Despite a state having a wide margin of appreciation, it should pursue a legitimate aim, which must be clearly defined. And the essential, uh, essential attention within the court's methodology in such cases must be paid to the proportionality test. In this context, I find fair enough Lon Fuller's opinion, who said, applying a norm to a human individual is not like deciding what to do about a rabid animal or dilapidated horse. It involves paying attention to a point of view. As such, it embodies a crucial dignitarian idea respecting the dignity of those to whom the norms are applied as beings capable of explaining themselves. themselves. Indeed, wartime and times of emergency challenge the rule of law. But as far as judicial power is not replaced by police or military operations or revolutionary expediency, Russia's war will not kill the rule of law in Ukraine and Europe. Thus, the role of the independent, high-quality judiciary as a guarantor of the rule of law became even more important in challenging times, and I suppose we all know about it. In this respect, Lord Neuberger, the former president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, during his Bar Council Law Reform Lecture in 2016, emphasized the United Kingdom has enjoyed over 300 years without a revolution, invasion or dictator. There is a danger of taking the rule of law and in particular the importance of an independent, high-quality judiciary for granted. And this danger is reinforced if the public doesn't understand how and why the system works as it does. In contrast and in comparison with Ukraine, the judiciary has not had any period of stability for the last at least 100 years. Soviet totalitarianism and Second World War, perestroika and the collapse of the USSR were changed to independence times of turbulence and instability, everlasting judicial reforms, all kinds of experiments and finally the full-scale Russian invasion. As a result, the general public doesn't understand how and why the system works as it does, 
which causes a lot of political manipulations with public opinion, and in particular cause a low level of public confidence in the judiciary. Russian war in Ukraine is a tragedy that will span generations. It is an existential threat to the Ukrainian nation. It has been a continued attempt to, of Russia to eradicate the Ukrainian language, culture, and the nation as such. However, the international agreements after the Second World War, the shared idea of never again, and the Budapest Memorandum 1994, make the current try of Russia as brutal and cynical as ever before, and therefore unprecedentedly threatening the international legal order and the international rule of law. The challenges that the Ukrainian judiciary meets are multi-level. There are internal and external enemies. Dozens of collaborationists have been brought into criminal responsibility. There are 11,000 pending disciplinary complaints against judges in Ukraine. There is a conflict of world views between judges representing Soviet law schools and contemporary law schools. The system of courts is understaffed. There are more than 2,000 judicial vacancies. And despite Ukraine is a digital state with high qualified IT specialists, the current electronic court system in Ukraine has limited technical capabilities and requires, requires improvement. To address the challenges, a group of judges of the Supreme Court elaborated the draft strategy of the Supreme Court, which was represented at the plenum at the beginning of October this year. It includes the main directions for strengthening the institution for the next five years. It aimed to create a system that will effectively counter corruption risks, increase readiness for War readiness for work in conditions of war and other emergencies, promote digitalization to ensure better access to justice, better service, and a reduction of the expenses, communicate effectively with civil society and other branches of state power, to implement best global management practices, to develop the amicus curiae, uh, curiae circle, and to improve judicial diplomacy. This draft, draft strategy of the Supreme Court fits well with those requirements expressed in the Ukraine 2023 report of the European Commission, Commission on European Union Enlargement Policy. And one of the recommendations is that a new strategy for the reform of the justice system to respond to the challenges of wartime still needs to be developed in a transparent and inclusive manner and adopted. The European Commission report is a historical document for Ukraine as a unique European state whose European Union accession aspirations coincided with active hostilities to defend the state from the aggressor. Ukraine is not just another state to join the European Union. Ukraine is pushed by its geopolitical situation and war closer to the European Union. It was logical, but unfortunately under tragic circumstances for Ukraine to receive the status of a candidate state for joining the European Union on the 23rd of June 2022. So the report of the European Commission covers the period for last year from June to June 2033. And it contains a special chapter 23 uh, dedicated to judiciary and fundamental right, rights. It recommend, recommends, in particular, fill the open vacancies on, in the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, establish the service of disciplinary inspectors of High Council of Justice, 
complete a comprehensive IT audit and um, including the development of the new case management system. In the sub-paragraph, sub-chapter, independence and impartiality, the European Commission concluded, despite the legal and institutional guarantees, the risks of undue internal and external independence, excuse me, interference in the work of the judiciary and the prosecution service persist, and further efforts by the competent institutions are needed to effectively reduce them. The ensuring internal and external independence of the judiciary has been the first time identified by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of agro-complex against Ukraine in 2011. This case concerned the insolvency proceedings initiated by a private company against the biggest oil refinery in Ukraine in an attempt to recover its outstanding debts. The applicant company complained in particular about the unfairness of the insolvency proceedings, alleging that the domestic courts had not been independent or impartial given the intense political pressure surrounding the case. The state authorities have a strong interest in its outcome, and the European Court of Human Rights held that there had been a violation of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Convention as regards the lack of independence and impartiality of the domestic courts. <clears throat> the fact that in the present case, the president of the Higher Arbitration, that time Higher Administration, Arbitration Court, had given direct instructions to his deputies to reconsider the court's ruling had been contrary to the principle of internal judicial independence. In the relatively recent case uh, of some scene against Ukraine, a different aspect of the issue of independence was considered, namely automatic, automatic lustration as a legal ground for the dismissal of judges. The case concerned the dismissal of a former Supreme Court of Ukraine judge, Igor Samsin, under the Government Lustration Act, brought in to address negative developments in public service in the period when former President Viktor Yanukovych was in power. The law was applied systematically to specific categories of public and civil servants, who had been in posts between 2010 and 2014, before the Revolution of Dignity. Mr. Samsing was banned from employment in the public servants for two years until the end of 2024, and his name was put in a publicly accessible lustration register. In addition, as his uh, resignation application was not considered, he was deprived of the benefits associated with judicial retirement despite being close to the retirement age. The European Court of Human Rights found a violation of Article 8, right to respect for private and family life, of the European Convention of, on Human Rights, and in particular, it found that the measures envisaged by the Lustration Act and imposed on the applicant had not been necessary in a democratic society. In the most recent case of Cherenka and Kolos against Ukraine, the applicants were dismissed as a judges of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine for their participation in a judgment which the authorities interpreted as an unlawful act restoring a previous version of the Constitution, which had led to the usurpation, usurpation of power of the former President Yanukovych. The court held, the European Court of Human Rights held, 
There was no indication that law limited in some way the scope of review that the courts could exercise in cases. It had been crucial for the, democratic, for the domestic courts to assess whether the applicants had been provided with sufficient guarantees of the independent and impartial examination of their cases and to address all relevant factual and legal issues that had been um, decisive for the outcome of the case. In particular, the question whether their dismissal had been um, compatible with the constitutional guarantees of judicial independence, including the question of functional immunity of constitutional court, judges limiting the scope of their legal liability for the results of their votes as members of the constitutional court had called for an elaborate response. It could not be uh, tacitly discarded that had to be examined in detail if the judicial review were to be considered sufficient for the purpose of the convention. As this had not been done, the decisions on the applicant's dismissal could not be considered sufficiently reasoned. Ukraine has been a member of the Council of Europe and the party to the convention for nearly 30 years. We learned many lessons from the biggest school of democracy. And we are still learning. My strong belief is that the Ukrainian judiciary is capable of being strengthened, strengthened in the context of the European integration process. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that Ukraine exists within the paradigm of the contemporary world and its economic, geopolitical, historical and security components. It was labeled for a long time as a post-Soviet state. However, for the last 32 years of independence, especially for the last 10 years, people of Ukraine have proved their ability to be a strong nation. The deficiencies of the Ukrainian judicial system are not unique within the European legal area, and the capacity and determination to overcome those deficiencies are still there despite the challenges brought by the aggressive war started by Russia. To ensure the independent, high-quality judiciary as a guarantor of the rule of law in wartime, I suggest following the, so to speak, 5S formula, which consists of five components, starting from S. First one is safety, security, because it places the number one, number one place in times of war. It is security of judges and uh, members of the staff of the courts. The second one is strategy. We should understand where we're going and what is our main goal which we would like to achieve. Third one, sequence. We don't need and probably we don't want a reform, reform or reconstruction, global reform for the judiciary in Ukraine. But what we need, we need to adapt, we need to adjust, we need to improve the system, to develop the system. At the same time, number four, we need stability because the, any system may be developed basing on stable uh, consequences and conditions. And uh, the last one is support. Of course, the judiciary of Ukraine needs support of the European Union and other international partners to survive during the times of war and to develop and to restore the country and to uphold the rule of law and democracy in Ukraine after the war will be finished. Objectively, there is a big difference in the 
administration, the UK and the Ukrainian judiciary systems. Despite our states coming from different historical circumstances, geopolitical situations and legal systems, we share the values of democracy, the rule of law and human rights, being the member states of the Council of Europe. It is noticeable that this organization reacted promptly to Russian aggression by its exclusion from membership on 16th of March last year. In my honest opinion, the voice of the United Kingdom as a founder of the Council of Europe and its impact and commitment to pan-European values, principles and standards are hugely important as stabilizing force in a dangerous time of aggressive war on the European continent. Thank you for your kind attention, for your interest in the topic of the lecture, and for your support of my country. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you.